Today, I'm driving Mercedes' smallest ever car at the time, and its first front-wheel drive car as well. No, it wasn't the Smart. Yes, I'm driving an A-Series, a W168. This, believe it or not, is a wildly significant car for Mercedes-Benz. The W168 A-Class is huge, even though it's tiny. Now, the Series 1 ran from 1997 until 2004. This little three and a bit meters of, of car is Mercedes' first front-wheel drive car, their first compact car, and so much innovation went into this thing. Let's walk around and have a look. At 3.8 meters long, it was the smallest car Mercedes had ever made. It's also one and a half meters wide, but 1.7 meters tall, which is bordering on SUV proportions in some modern terms, but that is because of the mad construction. This car, if you step into it, you'll notice it has very, very high seats, very high floor. That's not ground clearance. This is because everything mechanical is here in the sandwich chassis, which gave the car incredible safety. For a car so small, it was much safer than you would expect because in the event of a frontal impact, the engine and the transmission would slide under the passenger cell out of harm's way. In the event of a side impact, most bumpers are gonna hit below the pelvis and the, the hips of the driver and the passenger. And so again, less damage to the people inside. It also makes it great if you have difficulty getting in and out of a car, you can just slide straight into the driving seat, which is why many people buy SUVs. So this is a far better thing than an SUV. It's safer, better handling, it's not an SUV. Right, so lifting the bonnet on this thing, you will see, in this particular case, a 1.9 litre engine. I'll be honest, I'm not going to be able to show you a great deal of this engine because this is basically the airbox you can see on here and a couple of filler caps. The engine itself is at this level here. It's on about a 60 degree slope and you can just about reach the top of the spark plugs under a plastic cover with your hand like this. But I guess if you're servicing it, you would pull out the airbox to get some access to this. And the gearbox is here on the right hand side. So this is obviously a traditional in that respect front drive car, which is a new thing for Mercedes, the first time they've ever done this. At launch, you could have had a 1.4 or a 1.6 litre petrol or a 1.7 litre diesel. In 1999, they added the 1.9 to the range, giving a little bit more poke. Worth mentioning, not only is the air filter absolutely vast, so is the washer bottle. 4.2 litres, you can fill this car when it's brand new and never touch it until you scrap it 15 years later. As I say, Climbing into this thing is really easy because the seat is at bum height for most average sized people. And you climb in here and it's a funny mix because it's obviously a Mercedes. This feels like the, the wheel off an S or an E-Class or a 190 or something like that. These little kind of shapes here just really feel very, very Mercedes. But at the same time, it feels nothing like a Mercedes as well because the design language is totally different. Looking at things like the big bobbly controls on the seat slider and the recliner uh, dial and even this thing up here on the right hand side of the air vent which it controls your ventilation direction are totally smart you can sort of see where the smart car came from in its design influence and there's other elements as well in the shape of this kind of wavy s across the top of the dash and down here as well on these three buttons on this little control here so yeah you can see they were really were being very adventurous trying to push this car to new markets new buyers people who wouldn't have considered a mercedes before they were the people they wanted to entice into the Mercedes fold, get them into an A-Class for the first time as a, a younger buyer, and then they'd hopefully move on to a C-Class and an E-Class as time goes by. Very clever marketing. So what have you got in here? Well, it's a Mercedes, so you've got lots. Um, on the door, you'll notice SRS airbag, side impact airbags, safety a very big thing with this car. In, also in the door, you've got twin speakers. You've got a mid-range and a tweeter. The overriding design theme in here is oval and curved. A nice ovoid shape door handle with a big metal handle in it itself, very solid feeling, and a solid feeling curvy door pull as well. And below that, an absolutely massive door pocket with room for, well in this case, about 15 CDs and a window scraper, so very practical. The air vents on this car match the door handles. It's this same oval shape, a little kind of eyelets all across the dashboard and there's two more oh, big oval vents here in this dashboard uh, shelf as well which looks kind of like you could store things on there but the chances are they would possibly fall into the dashboard and rattle forever if you did. While I'm up here this 
as well as being a beautiful kind of flowing S shape, kind of the whole organic feel, all 90s design was very organic influenced, and this car, being a 90s car, followed suit. This is an epic T-shelf. You could have a proper picnic off the top of here. You've got room for a mug, mug, people in the back can have mugs as well. You've got sandwich space. You can put your twiglets and uh, fondant fancies down here in this trough area. This is a beautiful car for the tea drinkers everywhere. Uh, 10 out of 10, they're well done Mercedes. Because as well as that, you do actually have two on the go cup holders down there, which we'll come to in a second. Now down below this vent, you do also have a completely standard parts bin Mercedes light switch, which includes parking lights, which pretty much every other manufacturer completely forgot about, but Mercedes still do, which is a great little addition. It costs nothing, but makes the car that bit safer when you leave it parked up in the street for the night. And next to that, you've of course got your um, headlight dipping for heavy loads in the back, and we'll come to that as well in a minute, because that's quite extreme. You've got the instrument binnacle at next. You've got the three dials made up of the taco, the speedo, and the fuel gauge, and they just blend neatly into each other. All, again, all very organic, very curvy and oval shaped. Uh, this design theme is just never ending here. And it's quite fun because when the car's turned off, the needles just vanish from view. They drop into the bottom. You turn the key and they suddenly just appear as if by magic. In the center of that, you've got your LCD readout for the time and the mileage, and just underneath that you've got four little buttons, two on the left, two on the right, which are multi-function buttons. So you can reset your trip meter, you can flick between time and temperature. It says it's nine degrees, there's absolutely no way that's working properly because it's about minus four as far as I can tell out here. And on the right hand side you've got clock reset which doubles up as a dash dimmer and brightener. So if you press and hold when the lights are on it gets brighter and darker. Very, very useful and thoughtful. Also, as what I thought was an aftermarket thing, it's actually factory little red light for the immobiliser, but it looks like someone bought it from, uh, I don't know, Aldi and they just drilled a hole in the dashboard, but it's factory. Who knew? And of course, being a Mercedes, this has one single control stalk on the left, which does absolutely everything. Indicators, windscreen wipers, and headlight flash. Now, in addition to this big, chunky right hand, and indeed left hand, um, dials for directing your airflow. Under the two centered ones, you've got little on off rubberized, knurled, bobbly, buttoned uh, controls for turning your air on and off so you can have a lesser or greater flow into the cabin from the center. And in between that, very big, very obvious, nicely placed as a warning light. And also, nicely big, nicely placed central locking so you can clunk all the doors down shut. Then we've got usual, completely standard. Uh, heating ventilation controls. And then underneath you, it's a lovely kind of swoopy S-shaped wave of buttons, um, which have the recirculation, uh, demist, and in the center, EC for economy, because the air conditioning is on by default. So if you want to have less power drain, you can hit that button, turn the aircon off. Apparently, if it was a, a the classic, the lower model, which came with very little indeed, this was a manual slider for stuff to do with ventilation. And then below that, we've got what looks slightly out of place, these buttons are big and chunky, but they look a little bit old fashioned compared to everything else in the dashboard. Look a little bit kind of late 80s, early 90s rather than the period the car was made. The two outer ones would have been heated seats if the car had bum warmers attached. It doesn't. Um, ASR is dynamic stability control. You can turn that off if you want to have a bit of a play. You've got your wash wipe on the back window, electric mirrors left and right, and then your heated rear window. The radio is no longer the original um, Mercedes unit is now a Sony, so we'll gloss over that. And beneath that, we've got this really cool little CD holder for half a dozen discs. You push the button, the CD pops out quite violently, and you notice a little red, red tag in the corner. As you lift that to close it, if there's a CD in there, it pushes the red tag into this little see-through window and shows red to show there's a CD in there. It's very basic, but brilliantly effective. And next to that, you might be wondering what this big plastic button with a get more bubbles on it is. Push that. Isn't that a brilliant cup holder? I love inventive cup holder design. They just fold in and out so nicely and the whole thing just expands as it's set free. Let me free, I'm a cup holder. Moving back through the center dash, we've got ashtray with, uh, I thought it was Mr. T, it's not. Who is that? It's a Fallout 4. Character. Oh, it's Fallout 4 character, sorry, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was Mr. T when I was looking from above. Um, <laughs> hiding in the ashtray, ready to catch you. Um, lighter socket with many USBs currently in it, very useful indeed. Five-speed manual gearbox. There are three gearbox options with this car. The best one is the manual, five-speed in this generation. Next up was an automated manual, which is kind of the same thing you get in the smart car. And like in the smart car, 
it's awful. Don't ever go there. And later on, I think it's around 1999, they put in a proper automatic. So if you prefer an auto, why would you? Um, you can have an auto, but this is the pick of the bunch. And behind that, we've got uh, four electric window switches, the front and rear, obviously. And we've got a lockout for the kids in the back so they don't drive you nuts. And airbag off warning light, so you can turn off the passenger front seat airbag. Brilliantly useful if you've got a kid in the front seat. And then behind that, we've got in a thing that was kind of copied by Sayat in the, well, in the current, or well, about to be expiring Leon. Um, you've got two cup holders. The front one is just about big enough for a cup. The one at the back is big enough for jelly babies and nothing else. I don't know why manufacturers do this two size thing because it's stupid. When will they ever learn? I should mention the seats, this car came with fabric seats. If you notice this pattern down the B post was actually on the fabric of the seats as well. This is the avant-garde trim level pattern. Every trim level had its own thing. The, the classic, which is the basic entry level car, didn't have anything on the B post. It was only a small pattern on the C post. And the uh, Elegance, which is the, the, the luxury one, the avant-garde being the sporty one, um, had a different pattern again. This has had an upgrade to leather seats, which were a factory option. This car came with fabric when it was new. And the, there were some interesting color choices as well. Uh, green being the most exciting, I would love to see a green one because as well as green seats, you've got green dashboard inserts as well. The, if this had the beige, which is surprisingly not a common option that was taken up. Um, if this had beige, it would have beige door cards, beige dashboard also. Now some interesting stuff. Where do you think the battery is on one of these cars? Bearing in mind, most of the mechanical stuff is under the floor. That's right, it's under the floor. Let's have a look. Okay, so the seat goes back to reveal a little panel here, and you lift up with your nail, unscrew this, pull out the floor, pull out the sound deadening, the battery, and the fuse box. It's all hidden neatly under the driver's feet. Important safety note on one of these cars, never weighed one of these cars. Although this is in a plastic box, it's probably waterproof. If the water level comes above the door rubbers, chances are you're gonna short out every circuit in the car and have a very dead Mercedes. Now moving on back, you have a curious mix of lots of legroom, but the seats are kind of curiously low, so your knees are right up in the air. So it's, it's comfortable, but not. But there is lots and lots of headroom because the car is very square in the back. The seats themselves are relatively comfortable, apart from the fact that you're kind of sitting a little bit yeah, squished in. Now you've got three seat belts, so you've got lots of yeah, safety stuff. There don't appear to be rear airbags in this particular car. I don't know if that was an option you could have had. You do have very big door pockets, uh, including Haynes Manual, because the owner here does look after his own car, good man. Speakers in the door, electric windows in the door, and the same matching elliptical door handles with nice solid metal handles again, and a molded into the door card armrest, which is quite nice. And uh, these nice sort of string elasticated -y, uh, map pockets, so you know, for gubbins and bits and bobs, which I don't know what it is about Mercedes. They always have this kind of stretchy material that looks kind of baggy and a bit worn out, even when it's not. It just looks wrong for the mark when everything else is so nice and perfect and Mercedes ish. You have this kind of baggy elastic stuff on the back of all the seats. Now, you do have a really airy, airy cabin. These windows are just huge, so much glass area, it's amazing. And then behind you in the C post, Rather than being a big lump of metal where you can't see out, you've got a pair of triangular windows, one at the top, one on sort of interlocking underneath it. So you've got the strength of that big metal post and an anchor point for your seat belts, but you've still got good visibility and a sort of decently sized rear window. And of course, the um, center seat belt comes out of the ceiling. And then comes the party piece, because these seats do more than just fold. Take a look at this. Okay, so these seats have a 60-40 split, and ordinarily, when it's not in use, the center headrest actually slots into the, the bottom of the, the, uh, the bench, so you can see out the middle of the back seat. Brilliant idea, but then, as well as doing that, you can then fold the seat forward, pull out uh, the headrest, uh, count you come, pull it all the way forward with the lever at the front, put the lever on the side, and then the whole thing lifts forward, so instantly you've increased your boot space by about double, but if you want to make even more boot space, lift this up and out comes the entire back seat. So you've basically got yourself a van. But that's not all. Not only do the back seats come out, into the front, pull this lever all the way forward and give it a wrench, 
out comes the front seat as well. So you've got a load space of about three and a bit meters. That's really, really, really useful. And something I didn't notice when I was sitting in the driver's seat a second ago, there are little drawers under both seats, which are absolutely cavernous. Here's the owner's manual, no, more CDs. Um, so you've got so much cubby, cubby space and storage in this car, it's just immense. And with the seats out, you can see how flat this floor is because everything mechanical is below the surface. So the inside of this car is completely flat. It makes it a very practical car, very useful indeed. And obviously very safe, as we've said before. And also while these seats are out and you can see this, this oval elliptical theme continues with air vents for the rear passengers, which are still oval as well. And it clicks straight back in. Now entering the, let's call it the trunkle area. This boot is actually quite a good size for a car this short, even with the seats up in the regular sitting position. There's a lot of space in here. I mean, you can quite easily climb in and take a seat. You could, you could have a nap in here if you wanted to. It's, it's actually more comfortable than the back seat. Um, but it's a really well thought out boot space. First of all, as well as having a elasticated luggage net which clips into the four metal hooks how things are loose steady when you're driving you've got a full-size spare wheel and jack under here with a little clip that hooks on there so when it's dark and raining and you've got a flat tire and you need to get this out you can pull that out without that banging and crapping your hand and hurting you very good i like that mercedes well done and then to the left and right you've got big big cubby holes the left hand one is just a storage locker the right hand one is the first aid kit which is the original first aid kit for the car. And not only is it original, it's got the part number for the A168. It is absolutely for this car. And I find this utterly hilarious that the shape of this recess is very weird. It's kind of thick at one and thin at the other. And so is the bag. The bag is designed to fit specifically into that weird shape. And this is never opened, completely unused. No one has ever hurt themselves in this car. Probably. Well, the engine is not too intrusive. It's quite a quiet little motor going on there. The handbrake is a long way down, you know, when you still have to use it. And uh, something I didn't really notice before, thanks to the flat floor, your feet are really right out in front of you, like in a sports car, which is pretty why your knees are so high up in the back, because there's no footwells to dip your toes into. But hey, let's go. Sun visors with mirrors, always good. This is very Mercedes-like in its smoothness. Obviously power steering, so the steering is nice and light. As I said earlier, the manual gearbox is the, the pick of the bunch. And this is a really nice little light touch, easy to drop into gear, uh, gear change. I'm very, very fond of this. This is actually nicer than in my C-Class. And the short stubby gear lever actually kind of feels a bit like a racing car kind of gear shift. It's very sporty. It's kind of a short shift thing going on. I like that. I'm hoping a GoPro will get this, but there's a W plate Toyota minivan camper van thing on the side, which is my favorite car of today so far. Now the thing which obviously I'm going to have to talk about at some point is the Elk test, because this is the thing everyone really remembers. You say A-Class, even sort of 20 odd years later when this four cars on and not a shred of DNA remains. People still say elk test when you say A-Class. This really surprised Mercedes when it happened. It was done by a, I think it's Scandinavian, Swedish maybe magazine, who tested the car doing a, a peculiar maneuver, a high speed, evasive, sharp turn, which is peculiar to Scandinavia when elk and moose tend to wander out into the street. And so you drive along at 50 miles an hour or something very fast, and then just at the last moment, stand on the brakes and wrench the wheel. It's almost like you're trying to provoke an accident, and they did, they rolled the car. Mercedes at the time were launching something else in Tokyo, and so they had to have a panic meeting when they heard this fly instantly back from Japan to uh, Germany, a meeting on the plane. They spent about a month working on massively panicked reworks to utterly revamp the suspension, this ESP, which became standard across the range at this point, because before that, ESP had only been optional across the range. 
So what they had to do was make it standard on every A-Class and of course in doing so, because you couldn't have an S-Class with optional stability control and standard on the base model or the base entry car in the range, they had to put ESP on every single car in the entire Mercedes lineup at that point. But with uh, reworked suspension, bigger added rear anti-roll bar, different spring rates, different tyre rates, everything, you name it, the car was actually suddenly very stable indeed and the handling has really improved dramatically from the basically pre-production cars which were about to be launched. In fact, I think they were launched and a few had reached customers so they had to bring them back and rework them, a bit like with the Audi TT when they discovered they would uh, flip at high speed. And the pedals are also quite light. Everything's very light in fact. The steering's light, the gears are light. It's a very easy car to drive. It feels like a car that was, it was this car designed to make people at ease and comfortable. Now with its very slippery and aerodynamic shape, the 190 is pretty good on fuel and quite responsive. It gets about 40 miles to the gallon according to the book, which is quite impressive for a car with a 1.9 litre petrol from 20 something years ago. Now that 1.9 litre engine gives 125 horsepower and 132 foot-pound of torque. So it's relatively good output for a sub two liter engine and it gives it a 0 to 60 in 8.4 seconds which for a compact car is more than respectable. Now we've hit a faster road you can feel how stable the car is it's um, picking up a bit of the bumpage from the pretty atrocious road surface which has got potholes falling apart surface a trench dug the entire length of it and just general other rubbishness but it's actually barely jittering at all on that and it feels really nicely composed and very quite very comfortable indeed actually. This is a car you could really drive a long way without any hassle at all. Now for a car that looks so quirky and individual, it drives so normally, and that's a crazy thing to say, but it's just a nice thing to drive. You do have this nice elevated seating position, which gives you a great view of everything around you. And such a massive greenhouse area in the car that nothing is going to surprise you. Even though these A-posts are fairly thick, the way that they're positioned and angled means that you've got a great view around them. You don't really have that big blind spot you get in a lot of cars. And it was really well thought out. Things like the radio position, although it's fairly low out of your eye line to see what station you're on, if you know what the buttons are, as your hand's on the gear shift, you can actually hit the station buttons and the volume control without taking your hand away from the gears. So this car was revealed to the world at the Frankfurt Show in 1996, went on sale in Germany in 97 and finally hit the UK in 1998. And when it did, Autocar gave the designer, Steve Matan, the award for the designer of the year for the exterior work on it. Interestingly, he had a good history with Mercedes. He'd done the W210 previously and was actually concurrently working on the W220 at the same time as he designed the outside of this thing. So he was a busy man. And Mercedes were staking a lot on this car. They spent 900 million euros investing in the new factory at Rattan, Rattin, it's in Germany, to, to, uh, to build it. And uh, in 1999, it became the first car that Mercedes built in South America at a new plant in Brazil. I won't even try and say the name of that one. Now we've hit a faster road at last, and I'm not gonna do an elk test because I like being this way up. I'm sure it'll be fine if it did though. But at 60 miles an hour, it's absolutely fine. It's rock solid on a good bit of road. It's quiet, it's refined, it's comfortable. I like this car a lot. I even like the fact it's got quarter lights here. A bit unusual on the car this new. Maybe it could do the sixth gear, but I'm not that worried. It seems quite happy at this level. Well, we're not going to do an elk test, but we have got a roundabout, so I can go quickly around a roundabout. And it's leaning a bit, but it's not understeering. It's gripping quite nicely. Feels quite confident, really. I don't think I'm going to fall over. What's all the fuss about? Now, having just said it could do with the sixth gear, this actually has a slightly lower geared for acceleration gearbox than you might otherwise expect on a car with this particular power output. This is the sporty avant-garde, so it's geared for speed rather than for, for comfort and economy. You need to look to the classic and the elegance for that. 
<laughs> so this car is really well specced. It's got air conditioning, ABS, airbags all around, ESP as standard, electric windows and all four doors. You've got eight speakers, two in each door, uh, leather seats as an option, sunroof as an option, uh, fold out seats that turn the car into basically a small van. This is a brilliant car. This isn't just a badge engineering exercise to get you to buy the smallest, cheapest Mercedes, as some people might think it cynically was. Okay, cynically it was to get you into the range. But you're not sacrificing Mercedes quality and refinement by buying the smallest car. In some ways, this is 20 years ahead of the game because now, for ecological reasons, people are being encouraged to buy a smaller car but at a more luxurious spec so that they're not using as much fuel and resources. This car was doing that in the 1990s. This is great. It's what's not to love. It's an interesting shape. It's curious to look at. I think it's quite, quite a good looking thing in its own way. Fantastic spec, comfortable, nice to drive. Doesn't fall over because they were shamed into making it exceptionally good. What a great package. Why wouldn't you buy an A-Class? Okay, you put it in the comments if you want. Give me a reason. Why don't you want an A-Class? I think you'll be wrong though. There, I've said it. There was an, a version called the A38, which they built maybe four of, they kept one for the museum, and the other three went to their Formula One drivers on the F1 team. And it was a twin engine 190. So it had a 1.9 engine in the front and a 1.9 engine in the back. So it's four wheel drive, 3.8 litre. God knows what the handling and performance were like. If I ever find one, I will bring it to you but don't hold your breath on that. <laughs> well, thank you for coming along on this ride in this rather innovative and quite exciting little Mercedes. It may look ordinary on the outside, but under the skin, it's a revolution. I hope you've enjoyed this. If you have, please hit like, please hit subscribe. It makes a massive difference to the channel. And so, thanks if you do. Join me again next time when we'll be driving something else. Bye. <laughs>